Hello, everyone. We're just letting people filter into the filter into the webinar before we get started, but welcome. Hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to our uh, webinar today, Agents of Change, your role in uh, addressing FGS. So thanks so much for coming. Um, I think just to get started, next slide. If we can just um, ensure that everyone is comfortable and can hear in their own language, please note that language and interpretation is available. Um, there is a live interpretation. So if you see that globe at the bottom of the screen, click on the interpretation button and select your language. If you want English, please select English. If you want French, please select French, just to make sure that everyone gets the most out of this webinar. Also, just to note that the webinar will be recorded and will be available at a later stage on the FIG website. And then we will also have a Q&A button um, for you to be able to ask any questions um, at the bottom of your screen as well. So please make use of that during our Q&A session. So now that we've got the housekeeping, uh, housekeeping bits in order, um, let's, let's get started with um, looking at what the webinar is going to cover today. So today, um, your, our, uh, our webinar is called Agents of Change, Your Role in Addressing FGS. And so to, to cover that topic, we're going to start with looking at what is female genital schistosomiasis. We're going to look at um, what is FGS, what are the risks, uh, what are the risk factors, what are the signs and symptoms, um, what are the complications, and then how do we treat and prevent FGS? We're then going to have a fun quick quiz for everyone to see um, how, how much of it you remember. And then we'll go into the crux of it, um, where we're looking at why FGS matters this International Women's Day. Uh, we'll also look at lessons from a panelist around bringing FGS into their work. We'll look at FGS integration into sexual reproductive health and rights. And then you will have an opportunity to ask the panelists questions in a Q&A session, and then we will be sure to share additional resources for more information. So that's how the, how the webinar is going to run, and we're really excited to be with you, and we're really excited that you're here, so welcome. Next slide. I just want to quickly say, um, you know, a big up to the hosts for this webinar. Um, and they are the FGS Integration Group, also known as FIG. And FIG is a coalition of organizations galvanizing joint action on sexual reproductive health and rights, um, HIV, HPV, cervical cancer, neglected tropical diseases, and the WASH sector. Basically, to use all of those sectors and work together in an integrated way, way to tackle FGS, which is a very neglected issue, which we'll go into further during this webinar. And then the other host is the IBP network, which has over 100 member organizations and really looks at highlighting and sharing best practices, experience and tools. So thank you so much and uh, to these hosts that we can have this webinar today. And then I just want to introduce you to the panelists. 
for today's webinar. We've got some fantastic people that have been on the ground and doing live FGS integration and advocacy. The first panelist is Patricia Jekonaya. She's the program manager of policy and partnerships, as well as the Mosaic project director at LBCT Health in Nairobi, Kenya. And then we've got Robinson Karuga, who's a research manager at L LBCT Health Kenya. Ruth Alotti, who's the principal nursing officer at Kolebu Teaching Hospital in Ghana. And then we also have Millicent Omar, who is a senior research officer currently working on FGS and SRH uh, integration in LBCT Health Kenya. So a fantastic group of panelists that are going to really um, take us through this webinar and all the amazing stuff that we have to present to you. So um, with that, shall we get started? Our first speaker is Robinson, um, who's going to take us through what is FGS. Um, go for it, Robinson. Right. Thank you very much, Liora. Uh, and hello, everyone in this call uh, from wherever you're joining us from. We're really delighted to be part of this webinar. And in the next few minutes, I'll uh, go through what exactly is bilharzia or schistosomiasis, and uh, we'll briefly talk about uh, female genital schistosomiasis. Looking forward to really good interactions because of this webinar. Now, schistosomiasis, also commonly known as bilharzia, it's uh, a parasitic condition that is caused by a flatworm or what we call a blood flux by the name of schistosomes. Now, these schistosomes have two life cycles. One part of the life cycle is in the human, human being, and the second life cycle is, and the second part of the life cycle is inside the host, the, the, the snail host that are parasites. So the transmission begins when uh, in Infected humans uh, either pass uh, stool or urine into or, or near fresh water bodies, and then the eggs from either the stool or the urine hatch when they get into, into contact with the water. And this uh, part of the life cycle, the larvae that have just hatched, uh, enter the, the, the respective snail host. Uh, then now it undergoes a second life cycle, and after a few weeks, the, the more developed stage or level stage of this worm exits the worm and penetrates and infects uh, humans who come into contact with this fresh water or uh, contaminated fresh water through the skin. Now, it's important to mention that there are two types of bilharzia or schizomasis. There is one that uh, there's an intestinal one, uh, which is uh, where the eggs are released through the stool, and the, the, uro, you, you, the, the urinary schistosomiasis, where the eggs are passed through the urine. That's how the life cycle continues. And as you uh, you see in the picture, uh, you know this life cycle happens especially in places that do not have adequate uh, water and sanitation facilities. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, now I'd mentioned that uh, the, the infection, the transmission through the skin happens when uh, persons get into contact with these freshwater bodies that are contaminated, uh, either as they're doing domestic work, washing cars, as they're swimming or playing in the water, uh, agricultural activities such as um, rice farming or any other uh, forms of aquaculture that happen with uh, freshwater bodies and even fishing in these contaminated waters. And it, it's important to know that this is also a gender disease uh, where you find a lot of the uh, mothers and girls spend time in this water uh, doing their routine domestic chores. So there's also a gender dynamic if you are related to this uh, disease. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the very first symptom that we see uh, immediately after infection or a few hours after infection uh, and as we mentioned, that the, the transmission have occurs when the, the level stage that exits the snail called the sacaria infects the skin. And you will find that within 24 hours, there is a rash. It's called a swimmer's itch, which resolves gradually over time as the worm, uh, and it's an immune reaction that happens on the skin. But uh, after this, the, uh, the, the level stage enters the skin, 
it uh, enters the bloodstream, a bloodstream, and then after that, the, the skin infection or the skin irritation resolves, and now the worm takes on a new life cycle and travels through the blood and goes on to mature into the in, uh, in the liver before it migrates either to the uh, intestines, the blood capillaries around the intestines, or the capillaries around the, ur the urinary bladder. Next slide. So there is chronic after when when somebody has been chronically infected uh, with, um, with 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 this. Uh, schistosomes and uh, the eggs usually leave the, the, the burrow from the blood capillaries into the blood. Some of these, not all these eggs get passed out into the urine. And uh, this condition is very common uh, in, uh, you know, amongst people who are infected uh, by the urogenital form of schistosomiasis. So not all the eggs uh, get passed in urine. Some of them get trapped inside the walls of the urogenital uh, uh, system, uh, either in the uterus or the lower genital tract. And this chronic inflammation uh, leads to what we call female genital schistosomiasis, or what we are going to call FGS. So this is one of the most uh, misdiagnosed conditions and is a very silent disease that afflicts uh, millions of women across the world. Next slide. So I'll take you through what FGS means, uh, you know, and, and some of the symptoms. So you'll find common, the most common symptoms that are often misdiagnosed, most times as a sexually, sexually uh, transmitted uh, infection. Uh, there is lower abdominal pain, there is genital itching, uh, there is uh, abnormal genital bleeding and discharge, and uh, we also witness a lot of pain or bleeding during or after sexual intercourse. Now, if FGS is left untreated, it leads to a number of complications, which also contribute to a lot of uh, stigma or other uh, social or domestic uh, tension or conflicts. Uh, some of them are primary or secondary infertility because of uh, the inflammation or the scarring that happens in the reproductive system, uh, ectopic pregnancies, miscarriage, there are cases of stillbirth, and um, this uh, long-term uh, inflammation could also lead to urinary incompetence. So these are complications that are often misdiagnosed because most health workers are not aware uh, of, of female genital schizomyosis. Next slide. Now, uh, this disease is preventable, uh, um, and we start with bilharzia, uh, which, you know, it is from bilharzia or schizomyosis, where it's a long-term inflammation or chronic or chronic uh, inflammation that leads to female genital schistosomiasis. Now we can start by preventing uh, or, or treating bilharzia using a drug called praziquantel. And uh, the most common dose that is used is 40 milligrams per, per kilogram, which is administered as an oral tablet. And uh, praziquantel can also be administered uh, to prevent the the, 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 to, to prevent the progression of the disease or it, and it kills the adult worm in the in the body, which prevents further in, uh, infection. And most marginalized people uh, in, in the, the most affected places and in endemic places are reached through mass drug administrations. So it's important or it's important to sensitize the communities that we live in to seek treatment early, immediately they start seeing the signs and the symptoms, especially uh, in uh, places that are endemic or the persons who travel to endemic areas. And where possible, uh, avoid contact with freshwater bodies that are contaminated. And one of the most common ways that people can use to prevent or to kill the, most, uh, the parasites are to boil the water uh, for at least one minute. Next slide, please. So there are benefits of uh, taking praziquantel for treating the uh, or for managing this condition. Uh, one, we take praziquantel, it reduces the complications that affect the bladder, the liver, and other organs. Uh, taking praziquantel uh, to manage uh, female genital schistomiasis will also reduce the anemia, and even for people who are suffering from uh, the urogenital form of bilharzia. And it also improves the growth and development amongst the children, and also 
prevent or reduces uh, the occurrence of, of lesions that are associated with female genital homeostasis. And just to emphasize that this drug kills the adult worms, and as we uh, use this drug to prevent uh, or to, 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 to reduce the, the inflammation caused by the eggs laid by the adult worms, we also reduce the chance of getting infection uh, of uh, you know inf getting infected by HIV and the HPV virus. So next time. All right. Uh, further, just to measure, uh, just to demonstrate additional ways we can prevent and control bulharzia. One is to ensure that there is proper uh, hygiene and sanitation measures by encouraging our communities to use uh, toilets, uh, pit latrines, and avoid uh, open defecation or open urination. Uh, because most of the times, a lot of these eggs end up in the freshwater bodies and contaminate them, and it keeps the life cycle of the eggs going. Uh, encourage communities to boil water before use for either bathing or washing. Or uh, alternatively, this water can be stored out um, where the adequate sun before it is used for for bathing or washing, and this can be for about a day or two. Uh, yes, thank you. Next slide. All right. So after this very quick overview of uh, bilharzia and female genital schistosomiasis, uh, please take time to just run this poll. There are five questions uh, that you can answer, either true or false. Uh, so, um, Leora, please confirm that our audience is able to see yes. So these are there are five yes. questions where we can do a quick quiz. Now, uh, depending on your screen, you may see the first three questions, but you can scroll down or you can expand your window to be able to see the five questions. So please take a minute or two to answer the questions, true or false. All right, so I'll give you a minute or two to do this test. So Lyra, alert me when we have, we have a good number of responses or when the time lapses. People are definitely answering, Robinson, so that's great. It's okay. Uh, when you have had a chance to go through all the questions, uh, we'll quickly review the answers. We'll just give people one more minute. We've had most of most of the responses. Thanks. Right, Robertson, do you want to maybe um, tell everyone uh, some of the answers? Oh, Robinson, you're on mute. Ah, okay. All right. So thank you all for, for your responses. So the first one is, um, is the first question, true or false? FGS is a sexually transmitted infection. Uh, the answer is false. Um, FGS is not transmitted sexually. It is as a result of chronic inflammation of the uh, female uh, genital uh, system or the urinary system, the urogenital system. Then the second question, FGS is spread by drinking dirty water. So the answer to that is false. Uh, FGS is not spread by drinking dirty water. And uh, as as this being a webinar on agents for change, this is communication that we can 
uh, sensitize our, our communities about. Then the other one is that uh, FGS is spread in fresh water where there are bilharvia snails. So uh, when people get into contact with, uh, with freshwater snails and they get infected by uh, the regenital form of bilharzia, the chronic inflammation of, uh, you know, that's caused by the eggs of these parasites is what contributes uh, to FGS. Then the fourth question, uh, and I'm about to end, uh, FGS increases the risk of HIV and cervical cancer. That is true. Uh, there is some data that shows there's an increased risk of uh, HIV and cervical uh, and the spread of um, the infection by the virus that contributes to cervical cancer. So that is true. And finally, FGS is expensive to treat. Again, that is false because this can be taken, this can be prevented and uh, treated using Praziquatel. So thank you very much. I'll hand over the meeting back to you, Diara. Thank you. Thanks, Robinson. Um, that was fantastic. So now that we've learned all about um, what schistosomiasis is and what FGS is, I think that I'm going to call on Patricia Jekonaya, who is a fantastic uh, advocate based in Kenya from LVCT Health, who's going to tell us why FGS matters this uh, International Women's Day. Why are we talking about FGS on International Women's Day? Patricia, please enlighten us. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Leora, just confirm if you can hear me loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, the theme for the International Women's Day this year is invest in women, accelerate progress. And um, when I every time I think about women or a person, it means uh, this is a call to invest holistically um, in women. So leaving nothing behind. And um, as we talk about FGS um, today, I would also like us to put a face of a woman um, as we go through the content of what it is, um, what are some, some of the signs and symptoms, and what are the long-term um, impacts of FGS on, on women. And uh, in general, and because numbers matter, uh, we have 56 million women and girls. Uh, who suffer from uh, FGS or have been impacted in one way or the other with FGS, but nobody's really talking about it. And the thing is this, that FGS is actually considered as a neglected tropical disease. And we all know, um, if you say you neglect something, it means you basically don't give it attention, you don't give, you don't put in the investment that is required. And many times I like to think of it like this. FGS is carried by a person. It's carried by a woman. And if we say it's a neglected tropical disease, what we are saying is the woman who is actually carrying this disease is equally neglected. So we are neglecting the person. And it's like we are saying that woman doesn't really matter in the bigger scale of things. So as we have this discussion today, let's just know if we are going to continue uh, talking about FGS as a neglected tropical disease, and given six, 56 million women are suffering from it, then we also have to rethink on how we bring this to the core so that the investments that are done in women ensures that no woman is left behind. We've learned that it's a devastating gynecological condition that can increase the risk of HIV infection by up to three times and cervical cancer. And uh, we have learned of the other issues that can come up in a woman's life, like infertility, uh, miscarriages, and stillbirth. And just to mention that these 56 million are largely found in sub-Saharan Africa, where we also have um, the biggest burden globally of HIV, and now we are seeing also increasing numbers in terms of cervical cancer. So um, sub-Saharan Africa, being in the African continent, we know our cultures and we know what really matters to many people. When a woman, for example, is married, the society has set expectations. And part of this expectation is that she will become pregnant, she will have a child. For a woman who suffered from FGS and it has resulted into either primary or secondary infertility, or she's been uh, miss, uh, you know, like um, uh, she's been losing her children before their term, 
or at that point of delivery, you get a stillbirth. We know what that means to a woman, a woman who has been looking forward to carrying that child. So um, as was mentioned earlier by my colleague Robinson, what this exposes these women to is a lot of stigma. For many of them, they've suffered rejection that has eventually led to other health complications like mental health challenges. So it is not um, a small thing really when we talk about it and thinking about the reproductive health, the desires and the dreams of a woman who one day wants to carry a child in their hands. So this means that in the spirit of universal health coverage that we are all talking about right now, prevention is really a major investment that for us to help these women not to get to a point where we are now all running around trying to figure out a solution for her, we have to prevent FGS um, infections amongst women. So it is frequently misdiagnosed as an STI and meaning that women and girls are often you know, stigmatized and assumed to be having sexual activities. And here, I have met women in the field. I have met girls in the field. You meet a 13 year old girl. When you talk to them, they say, I have never been sexually active. But every time they go to a facility, the provider concludes that they are sexually active because they are constantly coming with the same complication. They are constantly being put on antibiotics and they get labels. You know, they are labeled as the girl who is promiscuous. And this is a 13 year old girl who is innocent. And so this kind of stigma already brings about a lot of, uh, you know, self-esteem issues. So she will have low self-esteem. It affects her relationship with her parents. Or if it's a woman who is in a, in, a, in, a, in a marriage, for example, it affects her relationship with her partner. So we only continue compounding a, a, a lot of the issues and the challenges on this one woman who basically wants a simple service. And now we are introducing several layers of stigma. One, there's the personal stigma and issues of self, uh, low self-esteem I've talked about. There's the issue of the family stigma. You're the one person who's constantly going to the hospital and getting antibiotics and you're lying to all of us. You're not having sex if this is an adolescent girl. They're getting stigmatized at provider level, this is the facility where they need the solution to come from. But the provider is all also behaving like they're at a loss. They are not able to really get the correct diagnosis and therefore administer the correct treatment. Uh, and, and lastly, as I said, they're also getting rejection. If they're in a stable relationship, the partner uh, might actually reject this woman. And in some of our communities in Kenya, we've seen these women being chased and they have to go back to their parental homes without an explanation. So we, we, we can gain so much if we address FGS. There are a number of things we've spoken about, like just preventing HIV, being that they, you, know, you have these lesions that then um, expose a bigger surface area to the HIV virus, you're highly likely to get infected. If you have cervical cancer, highly likely that you will also get this infection if you are in the endemic regions. So doing this is really getting us a step closer towards ensuring that girls and women including those in marginalized regions, have access to a comprehensive uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights services so that we do not treat FGS as a standalone disease, but rather have it as a component of a comprehensive package for girls and women so that we do not leave any woman behind and ensure that by 2030, we have zero new HIV infections amongst girls and women. Over to you, Leora. Thanks, Patricia. So powerful. Um, so I think we can, uh, we, so for International Women's Day, we see that 56 million women's and, women and girls are um, suffering from FGS, but no one knows about it. No one's talking about it. And as you highlighted, it results in stigma, risks of HIV, and, uh, and in some cases, gender-based violence. So we're going to learn a little bit from Ruth Alotti, who is a nurse at the Kolobu Teaching Hospital, and um, in Ghana, and she is going to speak about lessons from bringing FGS into her work. Um, and this is going to be sort of real life experience around uh, working on FGS and addressing some of those uh, women and girls and supporting them. Ruth, over to you. Thank you very much, Leora. And thanks to my earlier presenters, um, Robinson and Patricia. I have really enjoyed the session so far, and I believe you have. 
My name is Ruth Alote. I'm a public health professional with Kolebu Teaching Hospital, a Ministry of Health facility in Ghana. And I'm also a subject matter expert on female genital schistosomiasis and an alumni of the Geneva Learning Foundation. Today, I'm privileged to be here with you to share with you some of my experiences that I have gained ever since I learned about FGS. But before I share with you, I would want you to spend a couple of minutes to take a critical look at the current slide. So it's a scenario about a young girl, 16 year old girl who resides in an urban community in Ghana. And in Ghana, it is not uncommon to find young girls who vacate and pack their belongings to go and spend time with their grandparents in the village or somewhere else where there are facilities like river sites where you can go and help grandparents or relations to wash clothes, to fetch water, and to help do household chores. So just like this young little girl, 16 year old, on vacation tries to get to her grandparents' place and helps with household activities. This girl loves to swim and loves to play with her friends near by the nearby stream. However, after some weeks, this young girl starts showing signs and symptoms such as lower abdominal pain and discharge. I'm not sure about what you are thinking right now, but I would have loved to know your thoughts. What do you think this young lady is likely to be suffering from? Well, if you started with us, Robinson and Patricia has said a lot about female genital schistosomiasis. And as you can see, lower abdominal pain is vague. It could be anything, and that is why we are all here today. Discharge could be anything, but are we likely to get it right? That is the question we all have to ponder upon. Next slide, please. Perhaps that young little girl who came from the village could get to the nearest healthcare facility. And who knows, she's likely to be misdiagnosed because research has shown that most healthcare workers have either very little knowledge or no knowledge at all on female genital schistosomiasis. Also, another likelihood that she could be diagnosed of sexually transmitted infection is very high. Because no one knows about it, they will look at the signs and symptoms and give you some medications to treat it. But unfortunately, most people who have been misdiagnosed go and come back with the same condition and never get treated. And if left untreated, complications such as cervical cancers, infertility, and the rest can set in. It is also a challenge for us all, and not only healthcare workers, all of us, irrespective of whichever place you are working, irrespective of your role you play, you need to learn about female genital schistosomiasis so that you can play a role for us all to end this menace. A survey taken at Madagascar showed that 100% of schools thought about schistosomiasis, but only one had knowledge on female genital schistosomiasis. This tells us that the knowledge gap across many African countries is so wide. So the time is now. Next slide, please. I'm sure you'll be wondering, why am I so passionate about female genital schistosomiasis? But before you know the end of this passion, I want to tell you it all started from the Geneva Learning Foundation when I joined an online course before the pandemic. 
this online course was about fasting hesitancy. But however, somewhere in between the calls, we saw an advert on female genital schistosomiasis and interested applicants who were successful had the chance to take a course on this disease. It just didn't take us applying for the course. It also took dedication and inner drive to complete courses so as to contribute to a much healthier society. Next slide, please. The approach for this new learning was fantastic because COVID-19 has taught all of us something new. And as you can all see, we are all seated at various parts of the globe, but we have been able to converge here today. And this is what we learned when COVID-19 came. So this new normal, the online learning, took us through this workshop that was spearheaded by Bridges to Development and the first package through the approach that the Geneva Learning Foundation used. This course allowed us to come together and converge at this online platform from 4th to 11th of May, 2021. And we had both English and French sessions. Apart from this online learning, we've also been able to have an in-person training on female genital schistosomiasis. And most of us are now subject matter experts on the condition. Next slide, please. What are some of the essential elements that led to our success? It took a lot of commitments, yes you need to be committed to be able to complete this course. You also have all the capabilities because as a healthcare worker, irrespective of whichever country you, you came from, you are capable of doing something about female genital schistosomiasis. Also your leadership that you show counted because at the online course, we saw great leadership being exemplified. And that is what helped most of us to be able to com complete the course. Next slide. At every learning avenue or every course that any individual takes, there's something that you take along. And for me, the Eureka moment of the learning that I took part was action plan development. And before I finish, I'll share with you my action plan so that you understand what I mean by my Eureka moment. And you can see from the slide, the number of people who applied to take part in this course and the successful applicants who were able to, you can see, all over the map of Africa, we were represented. Next slide, please. So this is an example of an action plan that I was able to complete successfully because of the guidance that we were given at the training. I'm sure you might have heard of action plans before and might think, it could be a Herculean task for you to complete. But at this learning, this Herculean task that you are thinking of was really simplified. And that motivated most of us to take part in this action plans and to complete it, not just starting it. So this example is from Ghana. And the writer is a 40 to 50 year old female from Ghana. The key things were awareness creation and case referral. The context in which this action plan was taken was within a tertiary referral hospital called Kolibu Teaching Hospital. It's in an urban area in Ghana. 
if you drive about three kilometers away from the hospital, you will find a water source. However, even though it's in a urban area, Kolebu is a referral facility. And in that case, it receives cases from all over the country and beyond. So that tells you that we receive cases from places where FGS is endemic within the country and even outside Ghana. People who have lived in the rural areas and might have migrated to urban areas visited Kolebu Teaching Hospital when they have symptoms of female genital schistosomiasis. So these are some of the things that made it perfect for us all to undertake this action plan within the hospital. And you can see the steps that I took to be able to get a successful outcome that I had. Next slide, please. Yes, I've already mentioned about the in-person training that we had in Ghana. Next slide, please. And these are pictures to tell you how we it was organized. Next slide, please. I've also been able to engage in community experience. And it's interesting to let you know that I've engaged a young girl as little as 10 year old after I gained this training because I kept on doing more traveling to communities apart from engaging my hospital community. I travel to places where I can find cases and FGS is something that we all need to talk about. Next slide, please. From the previous slide, you saw a statement from another person in another facility telling me that there's a community in Ghana that if you go there and you don't urinate blood, then you are seen as odd. For that statement, I had to travel to this community and I saw for myself. This was confirmed by the chief in the community and I had meetings with this 10 year old girl and the family. And my next slide will tell you more about what I learned. Next slide, please. Before I share with you the lessons learned, this is a facility experience that a middle-aged man approached me at work, introducing his female partner to me with signs and symptoms of female genital schistosomiasis. And as I speak to you now, it's been a nightmare for me because as a then, I knew nothing. So I referred this case to the obs obstetrics and gynecology department of my hospital. And this woman kept going and coming. By the time I learned about female genital schistosomiasis, the woman is nowhere to be found. A very frustrating situation. Next slide, please. Following the trainings that I've had, I've also been able to successfully organize several sessions on female genital cystosomiasis awareness creation. With the Nursing Now Challenge Group, I've also been able to get opportunities to pre present at conferences, such as the one just recently held in Chicago at the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Also, I've been able to facilitate in the upcoming FGS training that is being organized in Ethiopia and several healthcare facility level training. Next slide, please. From all that I've done, these are some lessons that I want you to take along. It's so important for us all to receive support from partners and significant others when we are engaging people with female genital schistosomiasis. I noticed that as a matter of fact, knowledge on FGS by healthcare givers is so critical. And we, might, we must not forget that migration is an important factor for us all to consider. 
also access to healthcare, and both financial and geographical geographical resources are important. So in your history taking, it's about time that you note, note where the woman is coming from, where the woman has spent his or her lifetime. And this will guide you to know what to expect so that you don't leave FGS out. Also, the level of education of the people concerned is a matter that you need to address. FGS usually leave people stigmatized. And therefore, just as my earlier present, presenter had said, we all need to come on board so that we can fight this menace and leave no stone unturned. Next slide, please. At this point, I want to say thank you to all our sponsors for bringing us this far. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, really, really inspiring information and, and lessons that you've shared from, from your perspective and your implementation um, of FGS in Ghana. So thank you so, so much. Um, I'm sure if there's some clinicians or health workers on the call, they're definitely going to have some questions for you. Um, so now we're going to go into um, our next section, which is around FGS integration with a sexual reproductive health and rights. And I'm going to call on Melissa and Omar from LVCT Health in Kenya to, um, to explain what her experience has been um, in integrating FGS and H SRH uh, services in Homer Bay, Kenya. So Millicent, please go for it. Thank you, Leora. I'm so happy to be part of this webinar. And uh, as Leora has introduced me, I work for LVCT Health Kenya. And uh, I'm happy to be uh, uh, the lead in uh, the female genital cystosomiasis integration in uh, in the sexual and reproductive health services. Next slide. Yeah. So um, uh, the issue of uh, on how FGS can impact on uh, the sex on the reproductive health of females has been quite uh, explained, which I'm not going to uh, emphasize. I think uh, the information has reached home uh, on how uh, sure. this menace can really impact on the uh, female's health. So uh, for the integration uh, we are working on, uh, this is um, uh, an integration uh, which uh, is being funded by the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. And the aim of this project is just to generate now the evidence on the acceptability, feasibility, and cost of integrating uh, the female genital uh, schizosomiasis into the sexual and reproductive health services in three schizosomiasis endemic counties in Kenya, and that is Homa Bay, Kilifi, and Kwale counties. The next slide. Yeah, so this integration has uh, uh, three overlapping uh, work streams. And so the first work, work stream uh, was uh, the development of a minimum service package. And this minimum service package was initially developed by um, uh, the FIG team, that is uh, uh, FGS Integration Group. And since that was a global picture or global perspective, so there was need also to contextualize it. So I'll move step by step. So the MSP uh, has three service areas, and as you're seeing, it is not um, a clinical guide to the clinicians or to the health professionals, but just a, pro a programmatic approach on how to uh, integrate MSP. So the three main areas we are having are health literacy, screening and diagnosis, treatment and care, and of course, the last one is overarching or cutting across uh, the the three above, and uh, all these three services um, as a result of what my earlier panelists have already talked about, uh, that is the knowledge gap which has been there, and also the issue, the fact that um, FGS signs and symptoms actually uh, mimic the signs and symptoms of sexual uh, uh, of sexual transmitted infections. So there's need actually to really go along with the. Uh, training the healthcare workers on how to properly screen and diagnose for FGS 
and also for treatment because if you don't know what you are uh, screening for then you will not know how to treat it yeah so before we started this uh, integration there was need uh, to uh, actually uh, look for stakeholders or do mapping for the stakeholders who would help us um, ensure that this uh, integration takes shape. So we had to, uh, first of all, meet the national stakeholders at national level who informed us also further on who else could really uh, support in this. And that, those are the list of people we had um, in our mind. And those list of people are the people who have really helped us to move this agenda of integrating uh, female genital cystosomiasis into sexual and reproductive health services. So we had a series of meetings at both uh, national level and the counties level. So the counties, we have three counties. That is Homer Bay, Kilifi, and Kuala. So we had to move from one county to another and just to uh, bring them into speed on the impact of these uh, FGS and also uh, to really uh, get meaningful and practical commitment uh, from them and also to lobby for budgetary allocations from these stakeholders. Because as we, as we speak, uh, some counties still uh, do not even buy prosequential or pro or procure prosequential and put in there in their pharmacy. So if a, if a female is diagnosed with the FGS, then it means that female will be told to go and buy prosequential at a different uh, at a at a facility. And who knows, maybe that female doesn't even have money. So uh, after this uh, a series of meetings, we came up with a finalized contextualized MSP which was having uh, uh, ideas or views from all the stakeholders we met. Next slide. Okay, so uh, work stream two from the development of the MSP and contextualization now, uh, work stream two is now looking at um, the implementation of the MSP. So how, how, could, how should this uh, minimum service package be implemented? So the implementation of this MSP can only work best if we target both community and facility levels because clients come from the communities. And as they come to the facility, they also need also to have it at the facility levels. So at the facility level, we are targeting the health managers from the county health management teams and also the healthcare workers. So within um, the facilities, we are having higher level facilities to uh, and also lower level facilities because uh, some cases would need referral. So there's also need, there's need to have a link between a lower level and a higher level facility. At community level, we have community health workforce and uh, for uh, Kenya, we are having community health assistants and the community health promoters. And for some instances, we're also having the peer educators and so for one also to access a community, you need to have gatekeepers also involved. So we are working with all those people uh, to ensure that uh, this agenda reaches home. Uh, so we've had a series of sensitization training, which we plan jointly. Uh, so we don't plan them as LVCT, but we have a joint plan with the Minister of Health who set dates for us. And uh, with that, we've... Uh, We've, we've actually managed to uh, meet our target for the first few, few uh, 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 meetings we've had, and especially for Homer Bay, we are, we, we've, done, we've done quite a number of meetings. Currently, we are continuing with other meetings in Kuala and Kilifi. So we've had such kind of uh, a series of meetings through, join, through pl planning them jointly by the uh, county team. Under work team two is now uh, we would like now to evaluate evaluate uh, the feasibility, acceptability, and affordability of uh, integrating FGS into SRH services through uh, um, through quantitative and qualitative research methods. So uh, that is where now the study team uh, come in, where we have different methods of data collection just to assess if this is workable. And we have uh, we have uh, we have qualitative research methods like the focus group discussions, uh, key informant interviews, uh, the IDIs, and also of course the quantitative research methods just to for, just to check on uh, uh, issues like how much does it does it cost a patient or a or a lady uh, to treat FGS, and even if they are escorted by a caregiver, how much does a caregiver part with? as they come uh, to uh, seek services for FGS. Next slide. 
Yeah, so those are just a few few photos we've had so far. And as as you can see, we, we during the inception meetings, we had a series of site assessment visits from some of the facilities. And also uh, the next photo is just showing on uh, some of the trainings we've had. Yeah, so we are having a consultant uh, there and also uh, part of the team are us and also the healthcare workers who are being trained to be taught. So when they are taught, it, it means they have to go back to their facilities and cascade the trainings to their colleagues who may not fit in a training session like this. And so uh, the, last, the last photo is just a teach-back session. So within uh, the trainings, we have teach back sessions from uh, the participants. So that is a, a clinician uh, giving us a, 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 a brief of uh, her findings from her group work. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, this one also shows uh, a photo we took during a practical session. So part of the training involves practical sessions. So we start with a theory, then we go to practical sessions. So we identify a facility where uh, we go as a team. So before anything starts, we have to uh, um, seek for permission from the various um, uh, health management teams. Then they give us an okay to conduct a health talk. So that, that was a health talk being done at the MCH uh, triage at one of the facilities. And the last photo is of um, one of the taught who had been trained and had already offered FGS service combined with the uh, uh, cervical cancer screening service. So she was just explaining on what uh, she needs to do, uh, like going to the pharmacy to take drugs and when she should come back for a uh, review. Next slide. Yeah, so from the lessons, I, we can say that uh, stakeholder engagement is key to a successful uptake and ownership and uh, meaningful participation and cooperation. This we've, we've seen and uh, uh, we are hoping that it's going to, uh, to be successful as we um, implement uh, the, the evaluation arm of uh, the, this project. Then uh, the other one is integration of FGS into SRH through MSP is possible as it addresses the FGS gap. And this we can, we can even see from what we've already started seeing from the clinicians, what they report to us. Yeah, as you can see, uh, one clinician, one facility in charge was uh, reporting that uh, she was, uh, I highly suspect I have treated so many FGS cases as ACIs and used to wonder why my clients don't get healed amid change of different course of antibiotics. And this one we even, see, we even heard from, uh, the, from Ruth's presentation. So uh, it's, the knowledge gap had been there. But now currently for the ones who have already undergone uh, this uh, tra tra training, they appreciate and they can give back the services to the community. Yes. Then the other clinician also reported that after health talks, uh, female clients just volunteer to be tested. In fact, for those who test positive, they don't even want to wait because for Praziquantel, we, uh, we always advise them that you take after meals. But now this client wants to be started on, on Praziquantel like adult direct observed therapy. Yeah, so lastly, continuous sensitization is needed at both community and facility levels to help demystify myths on Praziquantel and FGS. Thank you. Thank you, Millicent. Um, definitely uh, really giving live information on work that's happening in Kenya literally now. Um, so everyone is on the webinar should definitely stay tuned because Millicent's going to have a lot more updates um, on the work that she's implementing now um, on FGS and SRH um, integration. So thank you so much, Millicent. So now we're going to kick off and start a panel discussion and Q&A um, and hoping that everyone has some really good questions um, that you that you may have from um, from the presentations you've heard and the discussions and the discussions that we've had. I might kick off um, and ask all panelists to um, to switch on your camera, if you don't mind. And um, Robinson, perhaps I can start with you and just ask you. Um, is Prozzyquantil safe for children, uh, women and lactating, uh, pregnant and lactating women as well? So is it safe or is it only safe for women who may be, um, you know, not pregnant and, and breastfeeding? And what about children of below a certain age? 
Right. Uh, thank you very much, Leora. That's a really important question, and that question comes up a lot going out in the field. Yeah, so Praziquantel is safe for children who are above the age of five years, and that's why we have uh, MDAs targeting children in schools above the age of five years. It is also safe for uh, pregnant and lactating mothers, according to what the evidence from uh, that has been synthesized by the World Health Organization. And uh, to answer your question about whether it's safe for children below five years, uh, right now we don't have uh, you know, any, any, any dosage, but there is drug development happening right now uh, by the Pediatric uh, Praziquatel Consortium to, assess, to, to develop products that are targeted for children under the five years of age. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Robinson. Um... So the next question I have is for Patricia. Um, Patricia, you spoke a lot about the impact that FGS has on women and girls and why it's important this International Women's Day. And I think we all really clear that it's an important, um, an important issue to address. So we spoke a lot about misdiagnosis of FGS as an STI. And what impact does this have on women's trust and belief in the health system? and in health services. Right, thank you very much, uh, Leora, and apologies, my camera is not cooperating with me today. Um, and maybe we should just take it um, in, in our day-to-day -day, uh, you know, experiences. If you go to a facility and you get a wrong diagnosis, you're highly likely to try again in another facility after a period of time and move to another facility like that. What this ends up doing to someone is uh, causes anxiety, and in the African settings, there are a lot of, uh, you know, myths and misconceptions and superstitions. And there'll be even, you know, like you can get comments like maybe it's witchcraft and can bring really a lot of things. So um, there's in increased stigma, it strains relationships, it frustrates not just the client, but also um, the provider that you're not getting, you know, the right treatment. This affects follow up at facility level. And um, issues related to misdiagnosis, as I've said, uh, goes beyond just the stigma and discrimination, but also gender-based violence, because you're asked to explain what you're suffering from and you don't have an answer. So it impacts on the healthcare you know, professionals. Um, if you're working on something and you can't figure out what the solution is, you begin to feel like the client is seeing you as incompetent. And this also definitely now affects the performance of the healthcare worker. Uh, it also uh, impacts on valuable resources. Um, I mean, there's the misuse of medicine like antibiotics. It's a continuous treatment throughout the year you're on antibiotics. We know that eventually develops, uh, you know, resistant for this particular client. And um, also health professionals spend a lot of time trying to work out um, you know, failed treatment and figure out what the solution could be. So it has an impact both on the on the health system itself, on the client, and eventually on the community. Because this client will also be talking to other people and realizing they are probably a group of people who don't seem to just get the right diagnosis and treatment. Over to you, Leora. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, really clear that it has massive, massive impacts not only to the woman but even to the healthcare worker. So on that, I'll ask Ruth. Um, Ruth, you, you are a healthcare worker. You've done a massive amount of work in advocating for FGS in Ghana. And um, what advice would you give to healthcare workers also on this call around what, what they can do to advance or advocate for FGS and raise awareness about FGS in their community? Thank you very much, Leora. I am still advocating that every healthcare worker, irrespective of whatever role that you play in your setting, you can do something about FGS. So if you are part of us today and you've learned what FGS is, the time is now. You have to start where you are, wherever you are playing your role as a healthcare worker, you start small with your small team and then you progress to a larger team and maybe your entire facility. And then gradually, if you locate a community where cases are likely to be coming from, and then you zoom in to that community and then gradually we'll all be able to conquer FGS. 
wherever we are. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. You've already given us our call to action. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, and Millicent, um, I'm I'm interested to hear from you how um the work that you're currently doing in Kenya and the buy-in that you've gotten from the Ministry of Health to implement the program um that you're currently um implementing in, in Homer Bay. We understand from this uh, webinar that often the ministries themselves are not aware of FGS and nor are healthcare workers, as Ruth also highlighted. So how did you get the Ministry of Health to buy into the program and to buy into FGS uh, integration? Thank you, Leora. So, um... Stakeholders' engagement didn't just start like uh, within one week or one one month, but it started way long. We had to plan in advance who are our targets in in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the SRH issue and also ne uh, neglected tropical diseases issues. Then from then, uh, the few people now are in, were involved and informed us of other stakeholders because for us to address FGS, it's not... Um, it's not an NTD uh, agenda only, but it encompasses all other people who are within the health spectrum. So first of all, meeting the lead, meeting the leaders, because if you don't meet the leaders, they are the policy makers, they are the influencers. We, ha we had to meet them first. Then from there, we, ha we scaled it down. And moving downwards, we, we gave each one a role to play. So if it is an NTD person, they have a role to play in all the counties we are moving. If it is a research coordinator within that county, they also have a role to play. So within our uh, meeting, we have everyone given a role to play, and this has really worked for us very well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Millicent. Um, clear, it's a lot of work, but uh, to get buy-in, you really do need to do um, meet people individually and then um, and then provide everyone a role. Thank you, um, Robinson. I might ask you a question that was written in the in the Q and A, um, and there was a a very interesting question around the relation between FGM and FGS, uh, female genital mutilation and and FGS. Um, and obviously, we're not uh, female genital mutilation experts here, but um, are they related at all? All right. Yeah, that's, that's an, a good question. I, I managed to type out the question in the chat. Now, um, FGS is a disease that occurs due to chronic inflammation uh, when eggs of this urinary schistosome are trapped in the walls of the urogenital tract. So FGS is uh, due to uh, complication of chronic inflammation. Uh, FG, female genital mutilation, is uh, a, a harmful cultural practice that involves mutilating the, 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 the uh, female genitalia, or uh, which is quite harmful. It is a cultural practice. So there is no association between the two. At all. Although uh, it is important to note that Female genital mutilation as a harmful practice often leads to other complications uh, amongst women and girls. Definitely. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, I think they can easily often be confused. Um, we see a, a question here, as signs and symptoms of FGS are similar to STIs, possibly Ruth, um, how do you actually clinically diagnose FGS um, because they are so similar to STIs? What procedures are done to diagnose FGS? Oh, sorry, Ruth, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leora. So from what Robinson presented, it was very clear. So if you learned about the signs and symptoms of FGS and you live in a facility where you don't have access to colposcopy equipment or you don't have obstetrics and gynecology specialists who perform pelvic examinations, you don't have to worry. With the clear signs and symptoms, you can start with management. 
you also have to always ensure that you bring out that factor, contact with infected fresh water source. That is very, very important because if the person has ever lived there or has come into contact with infected fresh water source, chances that the person is having FGS is high. And then yeah. the, no seeing the signs and symptoms, even exactly. if without colposcopy done, you can diagnose FGS. And if you are lucky and you find yourself in a facility where the service can be examined, that is a good thing where they can see the robbery tubercles on the cervix and the lesions, there are changes that are seen are also way that we can diagnose FGS. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, we also have, uh, we had, um, there was a question in French in the Q&A. Um, and I was wondering whether Anouk, you'd want to, um, if you don't mind translating it, and then we can ask the panelists to answer. Yes, happy to. So uh, the question um, in it has to do uh, about the supply of uh, Prezaquantil. Um, and uh, uh, the question is, why is Prezaquantil in short, short supply in certain countries, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo? And what solutions can you envisage? So it's about the availability and accessibility of Prezaquantil and supply of Prezaquantil. Uh, Thanks, Anouk. And definitely, um, obviously, that need for um, for working in um, in you know integrated in an integrated way with other departments. Um, Robinson, do you want to give that a go? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, that's, that that that's an important and very practical question uh, because that's a challenge that uh, not only affects the, the Democratic Republic of Congo but also in countries like Kenya, where we are based. So there are a number of reasons that may contribute to the shortage. Uh, one of them is uh, inadequate data. So you find uh, in most health systems, uh, FGS and uh, urinary schistomyces are not documented or, or data on this is not routinely collected. So again, uh, most health policy makers or decision makers, whenever they're doing planning or policies and budgets, they rely on data. So if there's no data, most times it's not budgeted for. Another thing is that lack of awareness. So you find if these conditions are not diagon diagnosed, uh, again, it's not captured in the health system. So it's not budget for, budgeted for and procured. And also finally, the one that I can talk about is lack of awareness. Uh, as um, my, my, my fellow panelists have, have contributed, uh, there is inadequate awareness about these uh, neglected tropical diseases. So you find uh, there's no prescription, there's no diagnosis, no, there's no diagnosis, uh, and, and hence, therefore, there's no prescription. So that also leads to less and less procurement. And again, this is my final one. You might find many community members do not seek treatment for these conditions. As Ruth had mentioned earlier, it's accepted that if somebody uh, she has blood in urine, that's a normal rate of passage, so they don't seek healthcare. Uh, so in many words, uh, there's about three or four points as to why we may not have Prezequantil in our pharmacies. Thank you. Thank you, Robinson. I think you're really highlighting the need for advocacy in country and for everyone here to play a role in advocating for access to Prozequantol within primary healthcare settings so that we can make sure that um, that there is that medication readily available for people who may be suffering from FGS. Um, just to go on to another question that we got in the chat, um, and Millicent, I'm hoping you can take this on. Does personal hygiene, um, does personal hygiene and FGS relate? Uh, does personal, does increased personal hygiene less than FGS, or are they not related? I would say, uh, in a way, they are not related because FGS, the eggs are in the bloodstream. So one can bet even 10 times or even 50 times, but since the eggs are already in the blood, one's uh, 
once the worm burrows uh, the skin, why, uh, when uh, maybe a female has gotten into contact with that water which is infected, then it gets into the bloodstream. So it doesn't matter how much one bathes, how much one puts on clean clo clothing, but once it is in the bloodstream, it stays there. So the only solution is to get treatment. Get treatment. The only thing we can talk about now is social behavior change communication. So if this person is the one infecting the intermediate host, which is the snail, then that person needs to stop it. But in terms of body hygiene, no, it doesn't have any relationship. Thank you. So I think we can definitely see that there's a huge, um, FGS is probably one of the, the main sort of, um, you know, health conditions that require literally um, such a huge integration of different sectors. I mean, in your answers and in the presentations, we've mentioned the neglectical uh, tropical diseases, HIV links, cervical cancer links. Um, obviously, it's sexual reproductive health um, because it's diagnosed through a pelvic exam and it has sexual reproductive health um, symptoms. And then also um, the wash sector, the water and uh, sanitation um, sector, because of the fact that um, we need the water sources to remain clean and we need adequate access to clean water and toilets. So it really, really shows the importance of uh, multi-sectoral working. Um, but it definitely is possible, as we can see in countries like Ghana, where Ruth has been implementing and where Robinson and Millicent are working um, and Patricia in Kenya. So our last question, uh, which Patricia, I will give to you, please, is do you know of any government funding work on FGS? Uh, we know that a lot of time, a lot of the time, um, governments are not actually aware of uh, the burden of FGS faced by women and girls in a lot of their countries. What is your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, I would answer this by first of all riding on the point that Robinson brought up around data. We know that data is really the what we use to be able to um, negotiate for budget allocation in most governments when it comes to um, health response. So in a number of countries, uh, the governments do not actually allocate funding for FGS. Um, the other reason is because Praziquantel is donated. So they don't see why there should be a budget, for example, to buy it when they know it's actually going to be given anyway. Um, and I, I think um, there are quite a number of uh, probably what we would call other competing priorities in the health sector. And so when you don't have the data, you don't have sufficient evidence, you're highly likely not to convince the government to put in funding uh, for a particular disease. And what we have also seen is that uh, within the neglected tropical diseases, the funding they get is largely for research. And what we have also experienced is that translation of that research into practice where communities also get to learn and understand how to prevent and understand it in simple ways that they can also be able to demand for a service is really a missing link. So um, this calls for a lot of advocacy and for those of us who are uh, having pilot projects to collect sufficient data and be able to utilize that, especially within the regions where FGS is endemic. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So we need to we need to advocate for FGS. We need to advocate for access to Proziquantel. Um, we need to raise awareness, and we need to collect data demonstrating how many women and girls in our countries are suffering from FGS um, and are often misdiagnosed as an STI. Um, and so that's really, really clear sort of actions and needs that we need to take forward from from this on FGS. Um, so with that, uh, I see there's no more questions, and I think we're just going to share a slide briefly, um, which is going to give you spaces that you can go to to access some additional information and resources on FGS. So one of the um, one of the resources is the Geneva Learning Foundation, and you heard uh, Ruth mention this. She's an alumni there. And um, they have an, a, course, a course on FGS, and that's a really good space to learn a bit more. Um, then we've also got the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance, which has um, genital 
schistosomiasis resources. Um, and that's also an excellent spot to find many, many resources and, and pieces of work related to genital schisto. And then also a reminder that QR, QR code in the middle of the, of the slide, please scan that and sign up for the FGS integration group, the FIG group newsletter, um, where you'll be getting information regularly on um, what's happening with FGS integration and one, what work's being done on FGS integration. Really important if you want to do any work on FGS going forward to please sign up to that newsletter. Um, and then we also want to, um, you'll see the link there, introduce you to the Boost app. The Boost app is an app by an organization called Avert. And they actually have um, a job aid within their app called Boost, which is on FGS and supports um, health workers to actually explain what FGS is to clients. Um, a really, really useful job aid if you're looking um, as a programmer to think about bringing in FGS awareness raising into your programs that you may be doing on sexual reproductive health or HIV but also for your clinicians in those programs um, to understand how to communicate FGS to community members so that it's understandable. So please, um, we'll share this, but please take a look at these resources for further information and learning um, and definitely sign up again for the FIG newsletter. So the last thing I want to say is that um, We'll, when you close the, the Zoom link, we'll be sharing a survey with you. Um, and a survey will pop up. It will literally take you one minute. And um, we'd really like to ask you what other information you would like to learn about FGS. Um, and then also ask you how you found the webinar. So please take two minutes to, uh, to do that survey as soon as this, um, this webinar is done. So with that, I would just like to, again, thank uh, the FIG group um, as the host, as well as the IBP network, and then really give a huge thanks to uh, Robinson, Patricia, Ruth, and Millicent, our uh, panelists, for their amazing um, presentations and information. And then also just thanks to, to the organizing team for this webinar. I think uh, everyone should just leave with uh, a call to action around, um, as Ruth said, the time is now. Um, go back, tell someone in your family about FGS, uh, tell people within your clinics and your Ministry of Health and raise some awareness about FGS so that we can start getting attention to this much needed neglected um, condition. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time and have a wonderful Thursday. We hope to see you soon.